Good evening, and welcome to The Right Side, where we talk about today's news, issues, and trends from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening, we're joined by Gloria Romero. She has a long and illustrious history, which we'll go over just momentarily. Most recently, she retired as a s senator from the state assembly, or the, from the state, um, and has represented us in the assembly as well. And she's currently re leading a group called Democrats for Education Reform. We're going to talk to her this evening about how her experience has been in trying to make change at the legislative level and what she had, what she plans for the future if she were queen of the universe as far as education goes in California. Gloria, thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you for inviting me. So tell me a little bit about, first of all, how you got into politics and what drove you in that direction. Well, I didn't plan it, except that I always knew that my parents always voted. I worked as a young person. Uh, you know, filing petitions and, of course, always backing other candidates. I was a professor at the university, and one day there was an opening for the, um, the community college board in Los Angeles. Folks suggested I run. I believe then, as I do now, that education is the most important issue. So I ran, I won, and once term limits came into play and they were upheld by the, uh, the state courts, there was an opening to run for the legislature, and that's when I ran. And so education was always important. The, the feeling like there was an opening and you could make a difference, you decided to just pull the trigger and go for it. Did you win first time out? Yes, I did. And so what was that like for people who go from, because well, many of us go in with an idealistic desire. We want to go in. We want to make change. We think if we can just get in there, we can make a real difference. Did you find that to be true? It depends on the person. Okay. Um, it depends on the commitment to making change, not just for the purpose of making change, right. but change that matters right. and using your time in public service to have the courage to shake up the system, to take on the special interests. You know, as a legislator serving in Sacramento, and of course, I served in the leadership of the Senate. I was the Democratic Caucus chair. I was the majority leader. I sat in all those back rooms, mm -hmm. and clearly I understood the power of money, the mm -hmm. power of adults who run the system. What was interesting, though, is that even though I always had an interest in education, I came to it first via being chair of essentially the prison committee in California. And uh, that's where, you know, I, I was in more prisons in California than you can care to imagine, for nothing that I've done. Okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe reassure you of that. But I visited more prisons in California, saw the high cost of what it means to incarcerate, and to understand basically that your typical inmate 70% of inmates in California don't have a high school diploma. Right. I mean, you've got to do the math. Personal responsibility, but you have to do the math. If we don't educate, we will incarcerate. So I looked at the uh, education system. I served on the education committee. And when there was the opportunity to become the chair of the education committee, I wanted that. And that's where I began to continue to not only write laws that give parents real rights to shake up a system, mm -hmm. but then to have the muscle to be able to push them through. And you were effective in that by helping to write and get past the trigger law. So that, and we'll go into that in just a moment, but how much legislation did you actually write that didn't go as far as getting brought up for a vote or, or making it to actual law? Oh, there were many bills, uh, many pieces of legislation that where I could not round up the votes overall. But when I look back at my legislative uh, history, I'm very proud that many of these pieces of legislation are really landmark laws. Mm -hmm. The parent trigger law, for right. example, uh, this is the law that the Wall Street Journal hailed as being the most revolutionary law in the nation. And mm -hmm. today, some 20 state legislatures have looked at versions of this law. Uh, seven states have already adopted a form of it. I was just in Texas last week working with Democratic senators there and Republicans who are interested in, in developing and strengthening a version of the parent trigger law that is on the Texas books. And for people who don't know what the parent trigger law is, give us a high-level understanding of what it means in California. This is a law that I always said I should never have had to have written. 
Uh, to me, though, what I saw was that there is a, I mean, you, we have a failed public education system. There's mm -hmm. just no other way to say it. It's half the state budget, six million kids in California, overwhelmingly poor children, uh, children of color. And yet I would always hear from status quo interests, oh, it's those kids. It's because they're poor. It's because, you know, yada, yada, yada. And, and that's not the case. That's really bigotry and mm -hmm. the very low expectations that children with quality teaching and a stellar academic environment can succeed. So I wrote the parent trigger law because uh, you know, the system we have in education, it's based on zip code. Mm -hmm. And based upon where you live, you are assigned to a particular district. There's no choice then when it comes to parents. Well, that's fine if your neighborhood school is succeeding, but we see in California, and I saw these lists in California, they call them the watch list, and, and it's like bureaucrats just sit back and watch, and there's thousands of schools representing millions of children in California that are on these lists that are not just underperforming, but chronically, year after year after year after a decade, mm -hmm failing. So I wrote, I started writing open enrollment laws, basically giving the parents whose kids are trapped in these documented failing schools mm -hmm. the right to basically say, I'm out of here. You don't fix the school, I'm out of here. That was the open enrollment law. And then I wrote the parent trigger law. I worked with activist parents in Los Angeles. I wrote the law and it basically uses existing federal laws, which apparently the bureaucrats never heard of because they never used the law to transform failing schools. And it basically gives the right to parents to gather, sign a petition, we the people, basically petitioning our government, you don't fix it, we will. Basically get out of our way. I saw schools on these lists that had sat there for 10, 12 years, and those are our children, and we can't wait for somebody to say, well, we'll fix it, you know, manana, another day. Mm -hmm. These are our kids, these are our opportunities. That's the parent trigger law. And so, makes sense to me, makes sense probably to everyone who's watching. The question is, since it makes so much sense, did it just sail right through with no opposition? Oh, it was a battle. <laughs> it was a battle. I'll show you the bullet wounds. <laughs> uh, it, not surprisingly, uh, you know, even though we talk about kids coming first in Sacramento, kids come last. Right. In the education statute, moneyed interests, uh, the, the interests of the adults who run the system. Uh, not only the California Teachers Association, but also the administrators of districts who have a vested interest in having districts as monopolies. Right. You know, children are basically debit cards and represent the cha-ching that goes into their district, whether the school's failing or succeeding. Uh, the classified uh, unions as well, too, that fear charter schools, many of which, most of which are, are not union. So it was a battle. And the interesting thing to me as a Democrat is who is I believe that education is a civil rights issue. I think it's an issue that should unite Republicans and Democrats and libertarians and you know bring everybody together because it, if we don't have great schools, we're not going to have a great state. We're not going to have an educated workforce. We're not going to have prosperity. And certainly for children, too many of them who are poor and minority, we're certainly seeing kids graduating when they do things right. Basically, though, at levels of proficiency in English language arts or mathematics that we should be ashamed of. It's a moral outrage. Well, and when you talk to some of the colleges or junior colleges about the quality of the students that are coming out of the schools, they're saying 40, 50, 60 percent have to go into remedial studies to just come up to the level that they should have been when they graduated. And so to your point earlier, we see scenarios where you have, if you set high standards, people tend to live up to them. But if you set low standards, 
people tend to live down to them as well. And so giving them a fair shot, which is what you're talking about, I agree, it does unite us across the ideological spectrum because I think at the core, the children and their education are all extremely important to us. Absolutely. And so how long did it take you to actually get it through, and what kind of opposition did you face? I mean, you talked about there was some battle, but uh, where was the walking head scratch for you? It's just like, I can't believe that these people are not going to let this through. Uh, it was constant. But what we did, though, was uh, you might remember historically at this time, uh, the, the success was very much, I think, enabled by having shared governance. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a Democratic president, President Obama, who challenged the nation with race to the top, putting out a call to 50 states to do things that we should do. And I think the beauty of race to the top was that with the Obama administration and Secretary Duncan building on what the Bush administration had done before, requiring accountability opening up the books and showing us testing and what it means and where you find disparate pockets. So Republican and Democratic administrations mm -hmm. interested in school reform. President Obama stood up and said, look, every state race to the top. I, a Democrat, reached out to other Democrats, reached out to Republican colleagues. We had a Republican governor at the time who I met with who would sign the bill if I could get the bill to, to his desk. But what I found, sadly, was that there was a lot of fear from members in my own party. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it's sad that the Democratic Party is largely funded by public sector union interests. Mm -hmm. The California Teachers Association is the most powerful political lobby and moneyed special interest in California. I'm a member of that union. I pay dues still because I'm still a, a teacher and I, I, I belong to the union. But I would see that money being used in Sacramento and in the political spectrum, basically fighting against everything that I fought for and stood for. Mm -hmm. So I would see this and I would see the fear that a lot of Democratic legislators had because many would have to decide, okay, do I go against the union by putting kids first? Mm -hmm. It should never be the trade-off, right. but that's what I saw. But we did get it through. We did form a very strong civil rights coalition the state chapter of the of the NAACP Alice Huffman was a, just an amazing and articulate voice on this issue mm -hmm. we had reverends from South Los Angeles joining us talking about the need for kids in California to have a fair shot mm -hmm. uh, we found a few brave Democratic legislators who understood these are about kids in my district that I don't want to send to prison mm -hmm. so we were able to move it through both houses of the legislature. Uh, sadly, the teachers union, you know, kicking and screaming and vowing political revenge, fought it every step of the way. And did they make good on their promise for revenge? Oh, absolutely. But you know <laughs> what, though? It's always, you can try to kill the messenger, but you can't kill the message. Right. And so I think it's important. I believe in public service, and I believe that it's important for us to do what's right. If you simply, you know, you, you can pass legislation, but you can't legislate backbone. Right. And I would like to see on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, to sometimes, you know, to challenge where they think their own parties have gone wrong. The yeah, more that absolutely. we can work together, I think we can advance solid and meaningful education reform. As, as we were chatting about before the show, I mean, as humans, we agree on 70 to 90 percent of the issues, and we may have ideological differences that will talk, that will change the solution that we might like to see, but one of the things that we've lost as a society is that ability, first of all, for critical thought, which is one of the problems that we, we really suffer from, but also the ability to look at someone who may come from a different place because there's a D or an R associated on the political side or, uh, you know, somebody considering themselves liberal versus conservative. And we're not thinking necessarily that people come at things because they believe in their heart that it's the right thing to do in most cases. There are some deviants, but, but if we come at it from that perspective and really do work together, we can get important things done like this piece of legislation. Well, something that I see right now that's happening nationally is that there is a national parents' rights movement. Mm -hmm. Gwen Samuel from Connecticut is uh, heading up this association. I'm working with her very closely. We are tracking and giving support to parents across the country who are basically challenging 
uh, zip code uh, 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 policies in their particular states. The most recent case is in Montgomery County in Pennsylvania, where Mr. Hamlet Garcia and his wife mm -hmm. were arrested, handcuffed, literally handcuffed, made to do the perp walk, put in jail, and they are charged with theft of educational services facing felony counts and up to seven years in prison because they defied zip code and their daughter, for a number of reasons that we probably don't have time to go into, was enrolled in a more academically performing uh, district. That case is going on as we speak. Kelly Williams Bolar, she was a mother in Ohio who was actually convicted, convicted, a felon. She, it took hundreds of thousands of people signing an online petition to the governor of the state of Ohio to pardon her. And usually governors pardon what? Murderers? You have to be a murderer. You yeah. can't actually just care about the education of parent. your children. Yeah. That's I mean, so a mom <laughs> fighting for her kids to get into a better school system, you know, we have to pardon her. And there are so many other parents, the Callahans in Illinois, who, you know, who moved their child into the better performing school district of the father. They were a divorced couple. The, uh, the, the, you know, the police came after them. The school police saying, you can't do that. So it's interesting to see this. But what I see happening is that more and more people, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, progressives, liberals, I think if we set aside our politics and we think about what makes California great, education is the key to the American dream. I learned that from my mother. Mm -hmm. She had a sixth grade level of, under, of, of education. Mm -hmm. But she, she knew and I understood education is what lifts you out of poverty. It's what gives you the key to, to do right for the next generation. And that's, the, I think, the beauty of seeing the Garcias and Kelly Williams Bolar mm -hmm. and the Callahans and, and so many others in just saying, this is the new fight. And uh, I, I look forward to carrying their spirit to changing the laws of this nation. But like you said, it's not just California. Stupidity doesn't just breed here in California. Obviously, it's breeding across the country. And so the question is, I mean, as we joked earlier, if you were queen of the universe, how would you change things? What would you do to move these things forward? And are there additional pieces of legislation that you think are going to be critical? Or, or even if it's not legislation, it's empowering the parents, it's empowering the communities to know what's available to them. What needs to happen to move things in the correct direction? You know, we know what matters. Quality teachers. Teachers matter in a classroom. So it's making sure that you have a teacher that is prepared and, and, and qualified to teach in a particular subject, one who's accountable, one where there are meaningful evaluations, unlike what's happening in California mm -hmm. today. It means giving parents choice. Yes, I would like more money for education, absolutely, but if we just spend it in the same way, we're gonna end up with the same failed mm -hmm. outcomes. So how do we use money in a system to transform that? I would give parents choice. I would abolish and eliminate education by zip code. Let us, let us vote with our feet. You know, where else in American life are you told that, you know, you can't go to this church, you can't buy a home in a neighborhood? Imagine if somebody was at the entrance to a public park and they pulled out a document to say, what zip code are you from? And you got to go to the park in your neighborhood. I mean, we wouldn't allow it. No, but it's discriminatory. Only, exactly. But only in education. And, and maybe insurance, and there's a fight about that. You know, judge me on my record. But only in education do we use zip code. And even with education, preschool. I can go to any preschool. College. I can go to any college. Only in K through 12, which, by the way, is represented by the California Teachers Association, is it criminal. Right. And we turn parents into felons having to steal education because, you know what? Parents should be the architects of their children's futures. Right. You know, I believe in parents. I always hear, oh, those parents, they, they're not involved. And then when we give them rights, then the powered interests try to fight the parents. Well, but it goes, I mean, uh, by allowing par parental involvement, uh, and, e and especially if 
the parents have to go out of their way to transport or have chil their children transported to a place that's not convenient for them, but is the best for their educational goals for their children. I mean, they're going to be more engaged. The children are going to perform better because I can tell you that the parents will say, look, we go out of our way to make sure you've got an education. You need to do your part, too. And they'll ride her and the kids to make sure that they do. Um, it just makes no sense that we would limit that. And you're yeah. right. That, that is one of the few places where we tell people, no, you don't have freedom to do that. Yeah. And you're I think stuck. with parents as well, too, we want choice because ch choice then um, it, 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 ra it, it shakes up the monopoly. Mm -hmm. Because when there's the monopoly, there's no reason to transform. You know, the check keeps coming in. Mm -hmm. If there's the body in seat with this trapped little kid because of the zip code, which side of the tracks they happen to live on, I know, the district knows, that that money is being banked. You can imagine if suddenly the parents are given the option to say, if this school doesn't turn around, you know, adios, goodbye, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And once we do that, give parents rights, I would love to see the local school do well. Mm -hmm. But the only way we're going to do that is by shaking it up, yeah. giving parents, empowering parents with legislation and rights and laws that they can use to really be participants in this democracy. So we have very, uh, just very limited time left, but I do want to hear your response because I can already hear the squealing. Ooh, but what about the what about the schools that are going to not have funding and they can't keep all of the teachers if everybody's going to these other schools that perform better? What then? People will lose jobs. What's your response? We put children first. And this is not a public works program. It's a public education uh, mission that we have. If we're willing to work, and I believe that vast majority of teachers want to work, yeah. but it's sort of the leadership that has put obstacles in the way of making good things happen for kids. When we put children first, then we make the changes that we ourselves can believe in. So if you were hoping that I was going to fight with you, I can't argue with much of what you were saying at all because we're in agreement. I know that many members of this audience will be, but if they want to learn more about the initiatives you're working on, how can they contact you or at least read up on what's happening? Sure, I, I would welcome it. I head up Democrats for Education Reform. Uh, my email is simple. It's simply Gloria at dfer.org or visit us on the website d, uh, dfer.org. I look forward to talking with them about the latest parent trigger advances, open enrollment advances, the national parents' rights movement, and the Garcia case taking place as we speak in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Well, I'm glad that you were able to spend some time talking about this issue, which you're obviously passionate about. And I actually want to stay in touch with you on a personal level to track what's going on, because this is a topic that's important to me and to our audience as well. So if you'll hold on for just a minute, sure. Gloria. We'll be right back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. government versus the people. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Look at the Electoral College example. Right? A leftist popular challenge to states' rights. You think the founders weren't brilliant people? Did they not know what they were doing by carefully calibrating to get the small states and the big states to come together? Why does Wyoming get two senators in California? Actually, I'd rather have Wyoming's two senators. <laughs> And welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. As many of you know who watch the show regularly, not only do they underwrite the show, what they're best known for is their speaker series and this evening actually a panel discussion on education reform, which was one of the reasons we were blessed in having Gloria be able to join us this evening. Uh, if you are looking for more information on them, we can tell you the details of the location is the IFES Portuguese Hall, the first Tuesday of each month. Uh, doors open around uh, 6.30 and the uh, program starts around 7, but that's at 432 Steerland Road right here in Mountain View, about a minute and a half from here if you're driving or walking extremely quickly. So as I mentioned tonight, we have the panel discussion on education reform. Next month, we will have Dr. David Bob coming from Hillsdale. In May, Bill Whittle of PJTV fame and Afterburner. And in June, we have Ying Ma, author of Chinese Girl in the Ghetto. And she talks about leaving communist China for what she thought was going to be a diverse culture and an open society where she could thrive. And she ended up in some rougher parts of Oakland and really began to understand what uh, how non-diverse the area could be. But in closing, uh, if you wanted to find out more about the Conservative Forum, you can go to theconservativeforum.com for more details. Gloria has shared a lot of very practical information with us this evening, and as we discussed on the segment, that it doesn't matter if you're a progressive or consider yourself liberal or conservative, Democrat, Republican, this is an issue that affects all of us. It affects our children, our freedom, our ability to thrive again as a state and as a country. So please do look her up and find out more information or get active in the school choice fight here locally because you can make a difference, but only if you participate. Thanks again for watching. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this has been The Right Side. Have a great night.